All right. Again, it's good to see so many of you that have uh, joined us back on Facebook Live and <clears throat> have joined us uh, on Google Meet. And I, I think we've got the, the problem taken care of, so now everybody can hear us. I want us to think, I, I, I'm, I'm doing a series of sermons about sad sayings in the Bible. And as this morning in our Bible class, I, uh, I, 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 there was another one that, that I thought I would do, but I'm also going to kind of uh, go back and forth with not only sad sayings, and we want to know what these sad sayings are so that we don't make the same mistakes as others did, but I want us to, I want to also do some sermons that are positive or happy sayings of, that are found in the Bible. Because I think also based on what we see people of the past, people in the Old Testament, um, people in the New Testament, there are some positive and happy things that we can see in Scripture that gives us hope and encouragement. But today I want us to look at another sad saying and that, that saying is found in Genesis chapter 13. And we'll be looking at that in, in a minute. You know, there's an old saying, <laughs> and uh, there, there's part of it I'm not going to share with you, but there's a saying that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. beholder. <laughs> Have you ever wondered where that saying came from? Well, this saying is a proverb. A, and not a proverb of the Bible, but it's a proverb. And when we understand that a proverb is nothing more than a wise saying, uh, a lot of a lot of the proverbs are, are are just wise, but it may not necessarily be true. But is this proverb? Is this saying a true saying? What is this statement? Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. What is that statement meaning? Well, I did some investigation this week, and I I, I looked and I uh, tried to find what I could about this saying, and and I did. I found what man really thought about this saying. The beauty cannot be judged objectively. For what one person finds beautiful or admirable may not appeal to another. It may be, that, and put an application on this, it may be that you bought a brand new car and you had this special color of paint put on this car. It may be the most ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. But you think it's beautiful. So beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Now, there's a song that sometimes our youth will sing. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Why? Because what you see sometimes can cause us to have issues. John, the Apostle John, stated something like this in 1 John in chapter 2. He, he wrote, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here we go, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is, is passing away and the lust of it, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. What is it that John wrote? I want to suggest to you that in a matter of speaking, John says, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Because John says, watch out for the lust of the flesh. Look out for the lust of the eyes. You know, these things that, that people look upon sometimes can we consider as beautiful something that we may want but the bible may be something but may the bible may have instructed us or the bible may be warning warning us be careful what you look at because you may go after it and when you go after it it could cause you some some definite problems in your life this week's saddest statements found in the bible we're going to talk about the man lot Lot was Abraham's nephew. And what Lot did uh, caused uh, grief for him. It caused grief for his family because of what he looked at and what he longed for. Now, what do I mean? Let's consider some things. John said and warned us about the lust of the eyes, right? In 1 John. So, what Lot 
did. He lusted. He saw something and he lusted after it. And so because that he looked and he lusted, he acted on it. And so when we look, we need to make sure that we don't lust after something. We need to make sure that it's something that is okay for us to do because it can have a direct effect on our soul. So we need to be careful what we look at because it may condemn us. But here's the, here's the second part of that. Just because that we look at something and it looks good does not mean that it's good for you. Let me repeat that. Just because we look at something and it looks good to us, beauty in the eyes of the beholder, does not mean it's good for us. Now most of you know that I love cheeseburgers. And my favorite cheeseburger is by Five Guys. Not only do I like those cheeseburgers because they're greasy and they're so good to eat, I love their french fries. And I know that there are many of you who are watching and are listening that know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll look at that cheeseburger, I'll long for that cheeseburger, but I know it's not the best thing for me to eat. It affects my cholesterol, it can affect my blood pressure, all the bad things. It's a good thing to look at, but it's not a good thing to have a total diet on, is it? Well, I want us to look at what Lot did. And that's found in first, or not first, in Genesis chapter 13. And I want us to look at verses 10 and 11. We'll go back and we'll review something in a minute. But I want us to look at specifically 10, verses 10 and 11. Because here is the idea that Lot looked. And because of Lot looked, he acted. And because Lot acted, it cost some, uh, it caused issues for him and his family. Verse 10, And Lot lifted his eyes, and he saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zor. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Now you may be wondering, who is the they that is, is talked about here? Well, this is Abram and Lot. And we'll look at why that happened here in just a few minutes. But, what did Lot do? What did Lot do that might have caused him some issues? Well, he looked at something, and he <laughs> chose for himself. In verses 10 and 11 of Genesis chapter 13, Lot looked and it was pleasing to his eyes what he saw. He saw a plain. The plain was well watered. It had grass for his flocks and for his livestock. So it was a nice place according to the eyes. John said the lust of the eyes. Just, we got to be careful that when we see something and when we look at something that is actually good for us. And Lot, more than likely, was thinking of this area as, as something good for him, his family, and his livestock. But I have other questions that come up when I read this. And it may be because I know the rest of the story. Why did Lot pick this particular place? Well, the Bible tells us that it was good looking, that it was well watered. So, I mean, I'm sure that had, had, had something to play with. But why did Lot pick this particular area? Well, let's go to the background of Lot's decision. And we, we'll see this in verses 1 through 9 of Genesis chapter 13. We see that now Abraham and Sarah are, are, are getting tossed out of Egypt because of the problem with uh, Pharaoh taking uh, Sarah and almost marrying her or making her his wife. And so uh, we're told in verse 1 that Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. And Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. And he went on his journey from the south. Uh, and uh, this is uh, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. That's interesting because where's where's Abraham going? He's going back to the place that he was where he first started all of his journeying around. And it's between Bethel and El, Ai. 
uh, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Here, it, here is Abram. He's, 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 gotten, he's left Egypt. There was an issue there. And so he goes back to where he begins his journey and he starts and he's praying to God. But we're told in verse 5 that Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to support them. In other words, the land that Abram was at could not support his family, his flocks, along with what Lot had. And we're told there, the possessions that each one had was so great they could not dwell together. And there was a strife, not between Abraham and Lot, but between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock, and also some people that lived in the land, the Canaanites and the Prezerites. Uh, so Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no, or not, don't let there be a problem between us. For we are brethren. In other words, we should be able to settle this and get and work this out between us. And he goes, he says, Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. And if you take to the left, I will go to the right. And if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Isn't that a marvelous statement from Abel? I'm going to let you, Lot. I'm going to let you make a decision. You make the decision where you want to go and where you go. I'm going to go the opposite direction. There's no strike between me and you. We just know we need to separate because of the, the type of or the amount of animals and family and things that we have. Now, we are told that, uh, that he looked up his eyes, a lot looked at his eyes, and he saw the plain of Jordan. Now, there's a problem with this plain. Sodom and Gomorrah was here around this area. And so as I'm reading and I'm going further in my study, I'm thinking, okay, did Lot know the Sodom and Gomorrah, or was Sodom and Gomorrah evil then? Did Lot know of Sodom's wickedness and the sin uh, sickness that was happening in this area? Did Lot see it? Did he understand it? Did he know of it? Now, I'm not sure that we can know all the answers to these questions, but Lot made a bad decision based on what he saw. He did not, if he knew of eagle, he didn't recognize it. The key to seeing any type of sin, dear friend, is to recognize it. Now how can we recognize what is right and what is wrong? Well, the Bible gives us what we need to know. As a matter of fact, the Bible is our spiritual glasses. It helps us understand what is right and what is wrong and how we can recognize what is wrong. And when we, when we recognize it, uh, we need to make sure that we stay away from it and we don't become associated with it. Even many places in Scripture, the Bible tells us the dangers that are associated with sin, and especially if we don't recognize it. When we look at something, and it may be sinful, do we look at it as saying, hey, it's, that's very pretty or very beautiful, and it's something that I desire to have? You know, there's nothing wrong with materialism, I mean, with having things, right? And I've oftentimes said that. And I've oftentimes told you that, you know, when we see something and we want that particular thing, that's not usually bad in itself, but if we put it before God, then now we've got a serious issue. That can become a sinful thing because of where we're putting our treasures in. Not We shouldn't be putting placing our treasures on things of the earth, but God and godly things. We need to recognize sin for what it is, and we need to recognize the dangers that is associated with sin, right? Now, as I said a while ago, when we recognize sin, we've got to learn to flee from it. Sometimes we people like to see how close they can get to sin and flirt with sin uh, without getting hurt. But let me suggest to you to do exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says to, 
to, to recognize it and then flee from it. Keep your finger here in Genesis 13 and go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's look at verse 22 where Paul is writing to uh, the youthful uh, Timothy. And he says, flee also youthful lusts. When you see these things, these lusts, these lusts of the eyes, you need to flee them, but pursue something else. Flee these, but pursue good things. Righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Therefore, look for these things. Seek these things. Pursue these things. James said in James chapter 4 and verse 7, or wrote, should I say, that we are to, when we submit to God, we will be resisting Satan. And we are promised by God that when we submit ourselves to God, fully holy, 100%, and we flee these uh, 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 sinful things, Satan will flee from us. We're promised. Now, a while ago I said that that uh, Lot made a bad decision. Go back to Genesis chapter 13. Look at verse 12. In verse 11 we see Lot chose from himself all, every bit of the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east and they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt, notice this, in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Now, a while ago I said, did, did Lot understand that Sodom was wicked? I'm not sure that we can honestly, 100% and confidently say that, that Lot knew. But yet we are given this uh, observation, we are giving this to think about in verse 13, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against each other? No. Against the Lord. So, there's something in that verse that kind of makes me think that maybe Lot knew something of, of, of the area. Maybe Lot knew something of Sodom. I don't know, but we do know at this time when Lot left or when Lot and Abraham separated, that, that Sodom was already very evil and wicked against God. And he made his home. Lot decided to make his home in this evil place. He did not recognize sin for what it was. Now friends, we are offered a choice, aren't we? God has put us on the road to life and He's given us the ability to make a choice whether to serve God or not serve God. You know, the way of, of the righteous is a narrow road, we're told. And few there will be that will find it in Matthew. But broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there will be that find it or go that way. Lot was offered a choice. He made a choice that was going to cost him. You know, when we are offered these choices, we need to ask uh, several questions. When we're looking at something and we want to do something, is it an appropriate thing for a Christian to do? Sometimes everything is not always about right and wrong. But is it an appropriate thing for a Christian to do? Would it be something that I would want to be doing and others question my faithfulness to God because of what I'm doing? Or do we look at this and, well, everybody else is doing it. And it looks fun. It looks safe and it looks enjoyable. So why shouldn't I do it? Because it may not be appropriate. Lot had this choice. He had a choice to make. We read it in, in uh, verses 1 through 9. He had a choice to make that would, that would either help him or destroy him. And unfortunately, he made the choice that was going to cost him. Now, I'm a firm believer. Because God has already made a promise to Abram that he was going to make his name great, didn't he? 
God has already made this, this promise to, to Abram. So if Abram had gone to where Lot went, and Lot would have went to where Abram was, I believe with all my might that Abram would have been blessed. I'm not sure that Abram would have fallen victim to what Lot did. Because God was with, Lot, uh, with, with Abram, and God blessed him. But Lot's choice cost him. It hurt his family. And it even cost the death of his family, or some in his family. Now what do I mean? Let's fast forward a little bit. Let's go to, let's go to chapter 18 and, and chapter 19 of, of Genesis. In verses 1 through 15, we see that, that Sarah is well in age and, and, and she has been promised, or Abram has been promised, that, that God is going to give them a son. And they're both up in age. But, we see that there was a problem with where Lot was. Begin reading in verse 16. These men that arose, these are angels that, that, that came to Abram. And they looked toward Sodom. And Abram went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what, what I am doing? Well, what was going to happen? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. In verse 20, we see the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because of their sin is very grave, I will go down there and, and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there, and they went towards Sodom. And Abraham stood before the Lord, and Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Abraham knew that Lot was there. And the angels were here and they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abram starts a bargaining process, doesn't he? The first bargain is found in verse 24. Will you spare it if there are 50 righteous souls found? God says yes. The second bargain is, uh, is found in verse 28. Would you destroy the city if I or not destroy the city if I find 45 and and it goes down to 40 and and, and verse 30 to 30 and verse um, 31 if you find 20 10 in verse 32 imagine that 10 people were not even found righteous in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And where was, a, where was Lot? Right in the midst of that. Look at verse 19. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. They went with the sole purpose of trying to remove Lot, his family. At this particular time, there's only uh, three people in Lot's house that I can tell. I know he's got sons-in-laws with his daughters that may not live in his home, but he has two daughters and a wife. And the men of Sodom come to Lot's house when they know that these angels are there. They don't know they're angels. They just know they're men. And by the context of the scripture we have here, these men wanted to know these strange men that were in Lot's house. And that idea of what uh, is put there the the words that are used when you when you study these words the idea is there that these men of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to know sexually these men that were in Lot's house I want you to look at verse 12 then the men said to Lot have you anyone else here 
son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city. Take them what? Take them out of the city. Why is it that Lot thought it was the best thing to do to take his family to this city? And now he's being told to remove them. Get them out of this city. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And even the angels at one point had to urge Lot to move. Even took him by the hand and get him out. But there was an instruction. When we get you out of here, do not look back. Because if you look back, you're going to die. And so Lot, his two daughters, and his wife were sent on their way. And in verse 26 of Genesis chapter 19, we see that Lot's wife looked and she became a pillar of salt. In verses 1 through verse 29 of Genesis 19, we see that some of Lot's daughters and his sons-in-law were lost, were killed, died, all because they have must light where they had living, or where they were living. They liked what they saw. And it may be that even though they weren't living the lifestyle, they approved of the lifestyle. You know in Romans chapter 2, I think it is, talks about those that like sinful behavior. You may not live it, but if you approve of it, you're just as guilty as if you're doing it. Remember in Luke chapter 17, verse 32, where we're told to remember Lot's wife? Why was that? Because she lost her life because she saw something that she longed for. She looked back. Now, we're not told exactly why. It could be that she looked back because she knew she had family there. She knew that she had sons-in-laws and sons and daughters and you know probably some grandchildren. She, she, she might have realized that they were left behind. And so as, as they were leaving, they were on her mind and, and she looked back. But it still cost her her life. And it all goes back to Lot's decision to pitch his tent toward Sodom. Remembering Lot's wife, we remember Lot's decision. When we read Luke 17, 32, we, we, it says to remember Lot's wife, we remember that decision that Lot made cost his wife's life. Yes, she made the choice, but that choice would have never happened if Lot hadn't have pitched his tent toward Sodom. I think about the family members that died that day. Because they liked where they were at. They didn't leave. Even though the encouragement from God, the encouragement from the angels that were there to get Lot out, and as a matter of fact, I believe, based on the study, that it could have been um, Abraham that, that caused the, uh, the angels to go there to get Lot out. In Luke chapter 17, verse 32, we, we remember the consequences of actions in choosing an area when he separated from Abraham. An area that we are told in Scripture that was very sinful. And everything goes back. Everything goes back to the decision of one man. Lot. You know, this account with Lot is a sad account. All because Lot lost not only his wife, but other family members. And he did it all because, or that happened all because he pitched his tent towards Sodom. That started the, the ball rolling, if you will. Lot was eventually pulled from Sodom by the angels of God. But Lot suffered because his choice was a choice that was bad. You know, when we think about what Satan does. Satan makes sin look so, uh, so pleasurable, so enjoyable, so fun, so, uh, you know, so inviting. You know, have you ever wondered why 
the lights are like they are in Las Vegas at night because these lights look so fun, so, so inviting, and it draws people in. There was a time when I was flying into the to Memphis International Airport, and it was at night. And I don't remember where I was, if it was a work assignment that I had to go on, but I know that Nancy and the kids were at the airport waiting on me. And As we were flying in, we were crossing the Mississippi River, coming in from the south side of Memphis to the airport. And I looked down at the Mississippi River and I saw all those casinos that are on that river. And we were way up in the air and I thought to myself, I could read, I could literally read the names of the casinos based on their lights. And I thought to myself, oh, Satan is making this look so fun for people. But I think about how many families have... It, it, it cost them their, their homes, their livelihood, because they looked at these lights and these lights drew them in, thinking that they could get rich quick. The sad fact is that many will look toward sin and they will make their homes in sinful places, doing sinful things, and allow their family to be overtaken. That's Satan's plan, dear friend. And so therefore, the saddest statement that, that I find in this whole account is when we are told, going back to Genesis, going back to Genesis chapter 13, looking at verse 10, Lot lifted his eyes and saw the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan. That, my friend, is a very sad statement because of the consequences of Lot's actions. Sometimes I think we need to remember for every action that we, every decision, I should say, every decision that you and I make, there is a consequence. It can be a positive consequence or a negative consequence. For Lot's sake, it was a negative thing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this account that we have in Scripture. And we pray, Father, that as we live our lives and make our decisions, may we always pitch our tent toward you and toward godly things and not allow sinful things to draw us in. Father, we know we're in a battle. We know that Satan wants us. But, Father, we know that you want us too, and that's why you've give given us your word to help us make it to heaven. Forgive us, Father, of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe that there's someone that would like to discuss this further. You can call me, you can come by the building, you can do whatever, but your soul is important not only to me, to this congregation, but to God. And so I pray that if you need to make things right with God, that you would do it before it's everlasting too late. Have a great day. We'll be back online here on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock as we do our Wednesday evening Bible study. Good day.